Welcome back, chemists. We are now in the final lesson of our discussion about light and electrons, and we're going to be ending with something called quantum mechanics. After this video, you should be able to explain the limitation to Bohr's model of the atom, identify the accepted model of the electron arrangement within an atom, and explain what the quantum mechanical model of an atom assumes. So we know that there were some limitations to Bohr's model. Um, obviously it worked for hydrogen, but that's about it, right? There was much left to be desired for other elements, such as elements that have more than one electron, or what we say, uh, polyelectronic systems. Bohr's model could not explain the emission spectra of multi-electron atoms. And therefore we had to really revise that model. So no longer was the idea that electrons orbit the nucleus like planets around the sun accepted as the model of the atom. So we had to do some revisions. And in comes quantum mechanics. So when it became apparent that it wasn't working, we're moving into quantum mechanics. And I will say that this is probably one of the more interesting topics, but it is, uh, it is not very tangible and sometimes very confusing for students. So we're going to do a little introduction here, but if you're not quite following everything, don't worry. Um, you're not going to necessarily be held responsible for all this information, but we're going to try and keep it as light as possible because you can get into some pretty crazy discussions. So let's talk about de Broglie in 1924. So de Broglie thought, that since light could be described as acting as a wave and a particle, he was wondering, does that mean that matter could also have wave-like properties too? And so instead of electrons moving around in a circular orbit, he envisioned these electrons as acting as a wave strung out around a circle where the orbits were different sizes. And so he developed an equation that predicts all moving objects have wave-like behaviors. Pretty amazing stuff. However, for a wavelength of a piece of matter to be measurable or observable, the mass had to be very, very tiny. And this is why we don't see, for example, baseballs flying through the air exhibiting wave-like behaviors. So since only certain waves could fit into certain orbits, it had a special name called the wave function. The wave function is what you know now as an orbital. Recall an orbital is the coordinates in which an electron can stay within an atom. So for example, we know that in the P orbital, um, in the, I, should, I guess I should say the P sublevel, the, the orbitals that comprise that sublevel is a PX, a PY, and a PZ. And in truth, we're so at this point focused on where the electron is and what it's doing, we really don't know where it is. We're making an approximation. And so this is where what we call Heisenberg's uncertainty principle comes in. The idea is that it's impossible to know both the position and the energy of an electron in an atom simultaneously. You can only know one while leaving the other uncertain. So what am I talking about here? What that basically means is if you're trying to, for example, measure the energy of the electron, that means you're going to disturb the position of the electron. If you try to figure out the position of the electron, you're going to change the energy of the electron. So it's not possible to know both at the same time. And that's what Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is. So here is an example of some of the different orbitals. These are specific to S orbitals. A node is a point at which we would not expect an electron to be located. Here is again some electron probability distribution. So again, instead of pinpointing exactly where an electron is, we use what we say a probability distribution or a boundary surface diagram. So where you see those darkened kind of black dots, that's where most likely the electron is going to be. We don't know for sure, but we're predicting that. Now we move into Schrodinger. 
And so in 1926, Erwin Schrodinger developed equations that took into account the particle and wave-like nature of an electron. It incorporated incredibly difficult calculus, and so we're not obviously going to discuss it here, but basically it describes the energy of an electron precisely. But there's large uncertainty in the position based on, again, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So the solutions to these equations are what we call those wave functions. And quantum numbers are used to solve these equations. So that's why we learned about quantum numbers earlier. That's why there's only certain values for each quantum number. So from these formulas, the probability of finding an electron in a particular area within an atom could be calculated. And in reality, Schrodinger's equation can only be solved exactly for the dun 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 hydrogen atom. But we can make some approximations for multi electron systems, and we can assume that the difference is not too great. The model proposed by Schrodinger is the model of atomic structure that we use today. And again, that represents the probability model. So you may say, wait, didn't Schrodinger have a cat or something? So if you want to, it might be cool to kind of Google Schrodinger and his cat. There's a very cute video that you can watch and I'll link it in the um, description so you can watch it when you have time. All right, chemists. So that concludes our discussion of light and quantum mechanics. You can now begin worksheet 7H. Thank you so much for watching.